Hi everyone, and welcome to the first part of the APT project. Although we all know that Will's favourite loco is the Class 58, I think if I had to choose my own favourite, it would be the Advanced Passenger Train. I don't know if it's my liking of the 70s and 80s intercity liveries, its futuristic stylings, or the fact I remember catching glimpses of her as I'd go past the Heritage Centre while growing up here in Crewe, but I've always had an interest in her. It might also have something to do with its underdog status, where her awkward and tumultuous development meant she never actually saw the proper prolonged service that she was designed for. For those of you who don't know the story of the APT, let me give you a brief history. In a search for faster speeds to cut journey times and increase popularity, one of the limiting factors on the Glasgow to London journey was the West Coast Main Line itself. Through the way in which the line had developed over the years, and the nature of the landscape through which it passes, the West Coast Main Line contains quite a few twists and turns. This made it hard to run trains at too high a speed for fears of derailment and for the problems it would bring to passengers such as being unable to stand and walk safely, and having items sliding back and forth all over the tables. So engineers came up with a very clever solution, a tilting train. By being able to tilt into the corners, it would help cancel out the effects of the lateral forces, and would allow trains to maintain a higher speed throughout the curves of the line. The development of the advanced passenger train was planned in three phases. The first being the experimental first train used to prove the concept which was called the APTE. During the early 70s, this version was designed, built, and tested with a fairly high degree of success. It incorporated some revolutionary features, including the tilting system and the new braking mechanism designed to help the train stop within the same signalling gaps as more traditional slower trains. In 1974, development then moved to the second phase, with work on the proper production prototypes called the APTP. Development dragged on for many years, with several faults in the design being identified along the way and concerns over the way the project was being managed by BR. But there were many successes that tended to get lost in the tales of the problems and flaws. On the 10th of August 1975, the APT broke the British Railway speed record by reaching 152.3 miles per hour, and later increasing this record to 162 miles per hour in 1979. The success of several design features was also such that they were later adopted by future locomotive designs. However, growing pressures from management and the government forced the development team to rush three APTPs into service in 1981. This didn't help a train that was already dogged by a lack of support from some areas, as the rush service revealed a number of issues to a press that were ready and waiting to pounce on the struggling service. Early journalist passengers complained of motion sickness, a problem that had been encountered earlier in development, but had been corrected, and which none of the other passengers on those early journeys complained about. But, once out in the press, the damage to the train's reputation was hard to repair, and the hammering continued as stories of breaking problems, doors not opening, and other teething troubles emerged. The APT finally made it into public service in the winter of 1981 with a service from Glasgow to London operating on the 7th of December. The journey down was good, and passengers enjoyed a much quicker trip than had been previously possible. However, on the return journey, some of the cars suffered tilting malfunctions, and the extreme cold caused problems with braking systems, as parts of the system would freeze. All the very public failures caused BR to withdraw the service just four days later, and the death knell was sounding for the APT. She eventually re-entered some service in 1984, but with very little publicity, and she was even relegated to short-haul EMU services in some instances, before disappearing forever. Two of the three trains were soon scrapped completely, and the third was preserved here in Crewe. Today, one of the power car units is in the NRM, and a remaining six-unit train is on display at the Crewe Heritage Centre, where they even operate her tilting mechanism on special occasions. You can also see the original APTE at the NRM Locomotion Museum in Childen. One advantage of living here in Crewe means we're only round the corner from the Heritage Centre, and so we were able to pop along and have a look at the real thing up close. Okay, so as you approach into the Heritage Centre, she hits you straight away along the driveway. And if you follow up the ramp just behind the 
pay desk you can see her in all the glory and you actually get to step inside And what they've tried to do with the coaches that are left over is turn them into a little bit of a museum to the APT and its development and its history as well as the preservation of the locomotive they have there. So there's loads of photographs and images on the walls, some paintings and various other bits and pieces. Um, and as you can see there's this beautiful model of one of the second class passenger coaches. Um, there's a model just at the bottom there of the APTE, some of the original seating, and a whole host of different bits and pieces telling you the history of the APT project. But then as you carry on and head through the back here, you can see you can enter the second class seating area, all decked out in its original tartan upholstery, as if we're right back there at the beginning of the 80s. A bit of a headrest needs replacing there and if you take a seat in one of them you can hope that the trolley service comes along while sat looking out onto the main line heading back to the museum there's a, a painting there that someone's done of APT over Shap along with more photographs from its development days, some of the original publications and the donation box. I think one of the things that's really apparent as you go around the APT at Crewe is they're doing their absolute best to maintain her and preserve her but they really need some more funding and support to try and get her back into tip-top condition. And then occasionally one of APT's younger brothers goes past Pendolino, the new tilting train. Going past then, past the power car into the second section of the museum, you take a left into the first class coach. Now there's a sign that was up on the door just as you came in that says about how they've had to reupholster the seats in first class. Um, but they weren't able to actually source the original tartan that was used because it would have cost over a thousand pounds to do so. It just goes to show how desperate they are for funding to try and preserve her and restore her to original condition. Another beautiful model. Not quite sure what gauge. again out onto the active main line heading into the crew station and uh, you just caught a glimpse there of the original blue tartan seats before we have a look at the guards van a little guards office there with the telephone and the announcement system and there again you can just see the original blue tartan that would have adorned the seats in first class and then we skip forward to the buffet car so we can actually take a step inside the kitchen. All still fully operational I believe. Um, I think they actually fire up the kitchen on special occasions so you can go to the buffet car and actually get some hot snacks and drinks. Even in original um, old style virgin cups I think they are. APT was fully kitted out for a full service all the way from Scotland down to London. And it even comes with a nice, not in any way creepy mannequin to simulate your attendant there. And then the final section is also open up to the public 
so you can head straight up into the driving car and step into the cab. And of course, Will couldn't resist taking a seat and pretending he could drive. <laughs> Making it look like he knows what any of those buttons do. But it really is fantastic to be able to get so up close and personal with so much of the train and catch a glimpse of what it really could have been like if she had have entered proper service. In model form, the train was only ever produced by Hornby between 1980 and 1984. There is a new highly detailed model of the APTE currently in production by Rapido Trains, which is due out around autumn time this year. But for the APTP, you'll need to search around on eBay for a second-hand version of the original Hornby model which is exactly what we managed to do. Okay, so this is the version that we managed to get hold of on eBay. Um, now this is actually the train pack version of the APT. Hornby also released it as a train set with all the track and the controller and the other accessories that you get as that full set. Um, but they released it later on as just a pack on its own. Um, now obviously this version, you can see the box is a little tatty and torn in places, um, but unfortunately you know, we can't be picky and choosy when there aren't many available to, to get hold of, so we had to pick the best we could and ultimately the model was more important than the box in this case. You can also see, probably straight away, that this particular version is the version with the black painted section all the way around the front and around the side window as well as the front. Um, this was the slightly later version of the livery. Early versions had just the dark and blackened window, but the entire end painted yellow. And Hornby did release that as the first version that was available back in 1980, um, but then the later versions came out with the updated paintwork. Now, when you actually have a look at some of the statistics uh, online about how many of these models were produced, there were actually fewer of these darkened ends in existence than the original first run, um, so to some extent these are a little rarer. Now at the moment in time, uh, having a look on eBay, um, these are going for anywhere from about £60 upwards for a set depending on its condition um, and obviously how many people have been on it at the time. Um, and there are other ones that are just spare odd units and things there here and there. So it is a bit hit and miss as to what's available, but if you can get hold of one, this is what you'll get. So if I open up the box, we can have a look at what's inside it. Okay, so obviously going back to the 80s, it's Hornby's polystyrene style packaging, um, and they haven't even actually bothered to start putting holes in the back at this point, so we have to carefully lift all the different units out. And you can also see right at the top there, there's a little section where you get a pantograph to fit in the top, so you can have a retracting pantograph on this as well. So if we take out, all the units first. Okay, shift the rest out of the way. And let's have a look at what we get. So, this is obviously the driving trailer uh, for the front and rear of the train. Doesn't contain any motors um, that, that power the train, they come in the power cars that actually go in the middle of the formation. So, most of this unit is actually seating that you can see inside. And it's interesting that what Hornby have actually done with this model is um, they've cast the plastic inserts out of a sort of pinkish plastic. Um, now, I assume that that's to do with the colour of the seating and the, um, the upholstery that was used in second class, which had a sort of red tartan finish, which you can see in one of these photographs here, taken from inside the APT at the Heritage Centre. And just to prove that that's what they were doing, here's the next coach along, which in the inside you can see is moulded in blue plastic, obviously to represent the first class seating, um, which had a blue tartan effect. 
if we go back to the trailer and then spin it around to the front, as you get again, as you can see, we've got the full painted black end around the windows for the driver there. We've got a small transfer at the front with the InCity APT logo, which is okay, but the lining is a little bit thin, so it does look a little bit rubbed off in places. Um, and just underneath, we've actually got some space for lights here. Now, the model itself is supposed to come with directional lighting, um, but only in the forward direction of travel. So you can press, just make out that even though the full plastic lens is filled in there, only one light at each end is slightly darker because that's connected up to the light inside. Um, so you only get forward lighting. But again, even that's not actually realistic because if you have a look at one of these photographs of the APT in motion, you can see that when in forward motion, the two outer lights are uh, in operation, but also the inner light there on the right hand side is the bright headlight. So they should have actually unblocked three holes, uh, three holes for the forward travel. When you have a look at the train at the back, uh, when in motion, there's actually no red lighting as there should be. Um, so it's completely blackened in reverse. Otherwise, the model's kind of as you'd expect for a, an 80s um, an 80s model. The moulding is okay. You've got all the different detail for all the different compartments and sections here at the bottom. You can actually see quite clearly the holding clips. They've not really been um, hidden very well in the model. Um, but all the rest of the detail is there. You've got the numbers applied. You've got the livery applied properly even down to the sort of red stripe that actually does follow all the way around the front of the cab there. Um, but it just feels a little bit plain. Um, it feels like it's missing some of those finer details. The perfect point is here towards the back. If you have a look, that's the toilet section. But over here where the door should be, there's actually nothing to really indicate that it's a door. You've got a little bit of moulded plastic here, which is the door runner, which would open out along, but there's very little to kind of indicate that it could open. There's a very, very faint line, but nothing that you'd actually expect to see on the real thing, um, as can be seen in this photograph here. And then when we come back and have a look at the bogey section, again, it's a little bit basic. Um, they've created this shared bogey um, between the cars by a sort of clipping system, an interlocking clip system here. So that clips into the second trailer to create the large shared bogey. But it's lacking some of the detail quite a lot. It looks quite thin and flimsy. It doesn't have a lot of the extra stuff around it. Um, and it even kind of just flattens off here rather than having a little skirt and extra detail going up inside. So the whole bogey, when you compare it to the real thing, does look a little bit simplistic. You can see there's an awful lot to be done there to try and make it look quite as important and meaty and, and have as many important parts as it obviously does. It does, however, have a tilting mechanism, just like the real thing. Um, there's a small plastic ray section there that as the locomotive goes around the corners, it pushes to one side. So if you imagine as it went around the corner, that would push the other way and that actually pushes the whole car to one side. And the tighter the corner, the more it tilts as it goes steeper up that curve. So it's a very simplistic mechanism, but it does at least give it um, a sort of vague tilting motion as it goes around corners. Now obviously in the day, this would have come with probably second radius or third at the most. Um, and so those corners would have been quite tight, and so the motion probably would have been quite um, pronounced. If we run it round some of our fourth radius curves, we probably won't notice quite as much of a tilt, but at least something will still be there. And then if we come to the front bogey, you can see there's actually some wiring attached there. Because the power car is in the middle of the formation, it needs some way in order to be able to get power for those simple lights at the front. And so they've actually 
put pickups on these two wheel sets at the front. So they're insulated on opposite sides and then a small copper pickup to be able to transfer the power up for the lights. And then moving along to the next coach in the formation, um, this is the first class coach um, with the blue seating as I pointed out before. And then again you can see the sort of clip mechanism for that shared bogey. So if I bring the two together, I'll show you what that does. You clip them like so, and it creates that large shared bogey. But when you look at it from the side, there is this massive empty void, which does look a little bit odd, um, as if they're just kind of floating. Um, obviously the two coaches aren't connected with a gangway properly. Uh, the gap is a little bit larger so that it can go around some tighter curves. Um, and it's just lacking some of that general detail and things like that compared to this, the real thing. Otherwise the rest of the detail is very much the same. So the roof and everything is very flat and plain. Um, you can see the clipping mechanism again that holds them together. And you can even see in some places how this window section there's a slight gap between that and the rest of the body because in order to create this flushed glazing um, effect these whole sections here are actually strips of clear plastic that have then been painted to fill in the bits of delivery in between but it means that the glass appears like it's flush with the surface but that has created a little bit of a joining error um, and a gap there. The bogey at the rear this time um, has a slightly different coupling mechanism to couple up to the power car but again it does have the tilting mechanism with the little ramps in order to make sure the whole thing rotates slightly. So next moving on to the power car now in a normal APT formation there would be two of these in the centre um, but in the Hornby model there is only the one um, but it is painted with the city logo on one side or the British Rail logo on one side and the in-city APT lettering on the other. Um, this particular one is the city of Derby with a painted emblem on both sides um, and it even comes with this car with the little danger high voltage warning sticker or decal just about the top. But that does highlight that it wasn't on any of the other coaches. So at no other point in any of the corners were any of the warning signs. But again, if you have a look at the photos of the real APT at Crewe, you can see there that there are some of the warning symbols across the top. And you can also see in this photograph that there should be warning symbols just above each bogey, warning you about how the gap um, can close and it, as it tilts so you don't stick anything in it. And if we cut back here to the model, there's none of those warning symbols above, uh, above any of the bogeys. So some of the external detail is definitely lacking. Uh, Having a look at the top, we can see this wiring section that follows along the top of the car, but this isn't in the best condition. So here at this end, the entire section has broken away there. It does, have a, it does have a little bit of residue around it, as if the person who owned this previously did try to glue it back in place. As we follow it along, there's then a break here with an entire section missing to join it back up. And then one final break here. And the two pieces do kind of go back together, but I don't really fancy my chances of gluing them back. So we're definitely going to have to have a look at some way of replacing that whole run of wiring to try and make it look more realistic and complete. And then at the other end of the power car, there's this whole gap in the roof here um, with a little pole that's designed for the pantograph. So if I just bring the pantograph across out of the box, you can see that it's a Hornby style retractable pantograph but at the bottom, the entire connecting section is all plastic, so it's not designed to actually be used to conduct any electricity. You couldn't use this with any catenary system, but the bottom plastic section has this sort of square cutout that allows you to fit over the top and push it down into place. 
Now, I won't fix that properly so that I can take it off again afterwards. But it does leave a little to be desired because you've ended up with this massive gap so that it can cope with the tilting and the turning uh, without the pantograph actually knocking against the main body. Um, but at least it's a little bit more realism by actually having a pantograph. And then finally we have the other two coaches in the set, which as you can see are just an exact mirror copy of the first two that we looked at. Um, but just like the train in real life, with the power cars in the middle, it means you actually have to have two identical copies of every coach on either side um, to make the full train. As a passenger, you couldn't actually travel through the central gangway that existed in the power cars because it was too noisy and perhaps a bit dangerous. Um, so once you were in your half of the train, you were kind of stuck there. So that's the model by Hornby. It's not the most detailed model in the world. Um, it's not the greatest effort we've ever seen, but it is the only APT P that you can currently buy. So if I want to have one of these running on the layout, I'm going to have to do a bit of work to try and see what we can do to improve her. And so in some of the coming parts of the APT project, you're going to see me tackling some of these cosmetic issues and trying to bring her a little bit more up to date. But what we also need to have a look at is how well she runs. So let's put her on the track and see what her performance is like. Okay, so I've put her onto the track, I've connected up all of her special couplings so that everything is linked together. She makes quite a long train even just in this five car formation and you can see the power car in the middle there. So if we bring it back to the front and try and give her a little juice we'll see what happens. And the answer is absolutely nothing. Oh, we have life in the motors. But they're not moving, so let's have a closer look over here. So you can hear and see the wheels are spinning. Oh, but we only get a little bit of motion, and she cuts out. Yep, oh, that's pretty much dead. And I think the problem lies in the way in which the power is picked up here. Um, I did notice when trying to put these and couple these together that a little bit like we had in the Class 91 project, if you go and have a look at those videos, electricity is only being picked up from the two wheels on this side at the front and the two wheels on the opposite side at the back. And so even the slightest little bit of dirty track or um, a slight gap in connection means we're just going to have a complete cutout here. So that's definitely something else we're going to have to have a look at if we improve her performance. But the other issue was these wheels were just spinning even when she had power. Now she has traction tyres on two of these powered axles, but they just seem to be spinning and spinning. So even with those, it just wasn't getting enough power and enough traction to actually move this whole train. So I'm just going to have a little bit of a tinker and see if we can get some motion out of her. have a little bit oh no spoke too soon I've been able to get her to move a little bit with the aid of a little extra weight so this is actually the um, weighting system from inside um, another class 91 um, so again if you have a look at the class 91 videos you will see that that sits in the middle normally uh, to help the traction of that locomotive but I've just propped it on top where the pantograph should normally go to add a little bit extra weight down onto that driving bogey, um, which does seem to help. It does mean that she actually gets moving um, and pulls and pushes the various coaches along, but that pickup and connection issue is still causing us a lot of problems. So I'll have one last go to see if I can at least get one pass past the camera um, before I call it a day. Nope, she just doesn't want to move really well. I think a lot of the problem is down to the pickups. It's just not getting enough power into the motor to keep her going around every corner um, and over every little bit of track. And then she just cuts and doesn't have enough forward momentum to actually keep her going because she just can't pick up speed because she's struggling to even push herself. 
So, she may not be perfect, but I do have a bit of a soft spot for the APT. Both the real thing and how she was a little underloved and underdeveloped, and the model that clearly isn't quite as well designed um, as it needs to be to perform. So what we're going to do over the next few weeks is try and have a look at the things I can do to improve the model and try and make her just that little bit better and more realistic and get her working more perfectly. So we're going to have a look at things like motor servicing and improvements and trying to obviously get her working, which would be a start. We're going to have a look at the wiring and power problem and have a look at how we can get power um, into that motor without just making, uh, making use of those two pickups. Hopefully, even making use of these forward pickups for the lighting system and seeing if we can actually connect all of these together. We're going to have a look at DCC installation and if we can convert that motor, um, which I think is an old Ringfield motor, into a DCC operable locomotive. Um, and with DCC installed, we're also going to have a look at installing better front and rear lighting clusters so that not only do we have the basic lights that come with the Hornby model, um, but we also have the rear lights uh, for the back of the train and that bright headlight in the middle of the cluster. I'm going to see if I can add interior lighting to all of the coaches as well. There's obviously four passenger spaces here, so I'm going to try and see if I can light those. And I want all of those lights to be under DCC control, so I'm going to have to work out how I'm going to connect these together and what chips are going to be needed where. From a cosmetic point of view, we're going to have a look at improving those coach interiors. So having a look at what I can do with these moulded plastic sections um, so they don't just look like some garish pink blob inside the, motor, inside the unit um, but are actually a little bit more realistic and well painted. Um, and I'm going to have a look at some of the exterior improvements that I talked about. So making sure the appropriate signage and warning signs and everything are included and some of the extra detail possibly around the bogey area and around the top of the motor, uh, the power car um, to make sure she's back in tip-top pristine condition. One thing we're not going to try and do is turning it into a full prototypical train with all the additional coaches that it would need to make it into its normal uh, running formation as not only would this make it incredibly expensive trying to source a second full set off eBay or some other location, but it would also need some substantial butchering of the unit to actually adjust the formation. There are guides online where you can see people who have cut up units and stuck them back together uh, in different formations to make a truly realistic set, but I think that that's possibly a step too far for me. Me and Will have also talked about how the train would become so long that it would perhaps look a little silly on anything less than a huge layout. This smaller formation certainly does look a little bit more at home in the scaled down model world. So all we're going to do is try and do our best to improve the model as she stands as much as we can, but we're going to stick with this cut down formation that actually ends up making her a little bit closer to the preserved version that we have here in Crewe. So hopefully I'll see you in part two where we'll start opening her up and having a look at what we can do with some of these upgrades.